any two-witted sword. It truly judges our thoughts and our attitudes. I pray you just uh, keep your anointing upon this word tonight as we go into this uh, this chapter this week of chapters 57 of Isaiah. I pray this in your name you claim it. And all those people said, Amen. We're in Isaiah chapter 57, and we're going to get right into it. And at the end tonight, our prophecy update has something that I've been waiting all summer to share with you. But I wanted to be in August because it happens here in August. If you know there's a solar eclipse that's going across the United States on August 21st, I'm going to share with you how that may you notice I use the word may, how that may tie into prophecy. I'll let you decide on your own what do you think it, it has merit or not, but that's how we'll end tonight. Father, thank you for this word again. Bless your word. May it do exactly what you said it would do, that it would go out and accomplish all that you said it would accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah gives so many different insights about so many different subjects, but tonight we want to start with Isaiah's insights about Jesus. As you know that Isaiah is a two-part type of book where the first 39 chapters have an Old Testament wrath and judgment flavor, and then the the last 27 chapters of the book of Isaiah have a New Testament flavor, which there are 27 books in the New Testament, and how interesting that those 27 chapters of Isaiah have a New Testament flavor, and that flavor is about the insights about Jesus, 700 years before he's even born. So we're going to give you these, and you can see it starts in chapter 43 with number one, that he is called the forgiver of sins, the forgiver of sins. Who could that be other than Oh, yeah. See, Trevon knows this is participation time here. So when I say, who could that be? Anybody else other than? Still just Trevon. All right. <laughs> the second one is found in chapter 44, verse 6. He's the first and the last. As a matter of fact, Jesus actually proclaims that about himself in the book of Revelation. And here's the other place where uh, actually what Jesus is quoting in Revelation, I am the first and the last. And who is that? Jesus. There you go. And so in chapter 50, in chapter 52, in chapter 53, he is He's the suffering Savior. Suffering Savior. And who's the suffering Savior? Jesus. There you go. All right. You and I are going to have fun here, Trevon. We, we, we got a few more. In chapter 53, he's the resurrected Redeemer. Who's our Redeemer? Jesus. There you go. He's getting on to this. And he's the God of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he sent his only one and begotten Son. And who's that? Jesus. That came from the whole world? There you go. Jesus. <laughs> number six, he is called the anointed of the Lord in Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 3 and the anointed of the Lord Jesus. there you go thank you one more that you can help me with here Trevon and the avenging and victorious warrior in chapter 63 verses 1 through 6 is Jesus, Jesus. thank you Jesus and thank you Trevon we kind of teamed up on that one there okay now go sit in the back back there with your family and be good all right <laughs> He was my help here. <laughs> uh, hey, aren't you glad Trevon's home? Why don't you thank him for helping us tonight? Amen? Good. All right, let's get right into chapter 57. As we go into 57, there's only 21 verses tonight. We're going to look at the first two right here. It's about the righteous. The righteous perish, and no one takes it to heart. The devout are taken away, and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. All right. Some promises there to the righteous. And if you notice, it says there's something different here between the righteous and the evil. Now, this is a theme throughout the Bible. The righteous will be on one side, the wicked will be on the other, 
or evil, okay? The sheep and the goats, Jesus does a lot with that. I want to give you four things. Two of them go together, the one and two and three and four. The first one is death for righteous is what is gain. Death for righteous is gain in Philippians 1, 21. To die is to gain. To live is to be with Christ and to die is a gain, all right? Now, when you go to Proverbs eleven ten, when the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. So looking at death, one gets a gain and one gets people shouting that they're so glad that they're gone. All right, now three and four both come from John. Most of you, grew up in Sunday school, and you know number three. I am going to prepare a place for you, and I will come back and take you to be with me. That's John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. You know it as it starts out, for in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not told you. And if I'm going there, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me. Everybody here tonight that knew that scripture and understands that promise, raise your hand. It's pretty much unanimous. Now watch this. You probably never read this one and realized it's the opposite. It's in John, but it's in chapter 8, verse 21. I am going away. This is Jesus talking. And you will look for me. And you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. Whoa. Whoa. Where I go, you cannot come. This is the difference between the righteous and the evil or the wicked. Very, very important here. These are sometimes the harder words that we don't often identify. We've been so inundated that God is love that they quit bringing about the other characteristics of God. And so today people are loving other people right into hell. This is a very powerful verse right here. I am going away. This was Jesus speaking. And you will look for me. And when you die in your sin, where I go, you cannot come. That's what happens when you die apart from Jesus. That's why we need young men like Michael Bennett that will go out and be evangelists and, and share the word and all the rest. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There is a place that God is preparing, and you don't want Jesus to be saying, no, you can't come where I'm at. It's amazing, no matter how many funerals I've done in the last 35 years, every time we come to the, to the funeral part of it, everybody believes that person's in heaven. I haven't had one time where I've done a funeral where they go, yeah, they're in hell. But the way is narrow. And he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And you can't get there unless you have him in here. All right. So the difference between the righteous and the evil, that's how Isaiah in his prophetic book tonight starts it off. And then he goes on a journey here, verses 3 through 10, deal with the subject of adultery. And he puts the, the, the connection between the language between physical adultery, but how it also applies to spiritual adultery. Listen to it in verses 3 through 10. But you come here, you children of a sorceress, you offspring of adulterers and prostitutes. Now, I think in, in mine uh, yeah, up there, oh, in another translation, it, it, it says children of falsehood. Wow, that, that's, a, that's a powerful statement right there. Who are you mocking? At whom did you sneer and stick out your tongue? Are you not a brood of rebels, the offsprings of liars? You, you burn with lust among the oaks and under every spreading tree. You sacrifice your children in the ravines and under the overhanging crags. The idols among the smooth stones of the ravens are your portion. Indeed, they are your lot. 
Yes, to them you have poured out drink offerings and offered grain offerings. In view of all this, should I relent? You have made your bed on high and lofty hills. There you went up to offer your sacrifices. Behind your doors and your doorposts, you have put your pagan symbols. Now this verse 8, I didn't highlight it on this, but this when it's being spoken to Hebrews and Jewish kids here, remember in Deuteronomy it says, write these commandments on these places, on your doorposts and, and on your doors, so that when your children come and go, they'll see the commandments of the Lord. Here God is saying to them, behind your doors and your doorposts you have put your pagan symbols. symbols forsaken me you uncovered your bed you climbed into it and opened it wide you made a pact with those whose beds you love and you looked with lust on their naked bodies you went to Moloch with olive oil and increased your perfumes you sent your ambassadors far away you descended to the very realm of the dead you wearied yourself by such going about but you would not say, it is hopeless. You found renewal of your strength, and so you did not faint. Hmm. Spiritual adultery, this is, this is a very sobering passage here because it's, 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 again, it's not to the pagans out there in the world. It's to those that know about God, to those that, that have heard the stories of the power and the might and the miracles of, of Jehovah. And, and uh, the first one here in spiritual adultery hits in Isaiah 57, three, it touches more than you know. See, we, we live in a society, if we were to move this, this right here to the Christian community today, we, we have this, if you're adults, if you're consenting, it, it, you can have a, all these other relationships and as long as it's under the umbrella of love, if it's done in the name of love, it's okay. Adultery, physical, spiritual adultery, touches more than you know. There's where these sayings here, children of transgressors. I think that's in the King James Version, and offsprings of falsehood. If you notice what is happening is, if you live in with this adulterous spirit, whether it's spiritual or physical or both, the transgression goes beyond you to other generations. Your offsprings become that of falsehood also. It's the going from it being a willful sin, a transgression, to what the Old Testament calls an iniquity. It's now generational, all right? The second thing is, is found, you, we jump now from Isaiah is writing in 700 and like, at this point, 22 BC, to John's writing way out there about 90 AD. And in 1 John 2.15, he says, love not the world, neither the things that are, that are in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So here's point number two. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Hmm. If you love the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. And all these things are going to pass away. That's 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Now he goes out and spells out what the love of the world is there. And, and this is very, very powerful. And you say, well, wait a minute. So okay, I enjoy the world. I don't know if I love it or if, if I've replaced God with the world. Let's go to James, the brother of Jesus, the author of the book of James. In James chapter 4, verse 4, and the first part of it, he says, friendship with the world is hostility toward God. It's not just loving it. Friendship. Wow, we don't hear this, do we? We always go, well, how do we, how do... The first century Christians didn't look to see how they could reach their culture. They told their culture there was a way that was different than the world. 
that if you came here, you would be transformed, that Jesus would save you, he would live inside you, and your thinking would be different, your actions would be different, and that friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Now, in the second part of that verse, James wonders if people caught how important and how severe this is. He goes on and says, whoever makes himself a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Not only are you hostile towards God if you have a friendship with the world, you become an enemy of God if you have friendship with the world. The world needs us to be kingdom people. They need to see us different than what the rest of the world is. And the clamor though in today's society is, can't we just act like the world, love like the world, understand them so much, you know, come alongside them and say, it's okay, it's okay. Jesus will love you anyway. He wants you to change and leave your sins behind. He wants you to come out of this world And James and John and Isaiah spells it out very clear. I think one of the most damning things against the church today is that we've made too much friendship with the world. And look what the Bible says will take place. Has the church, trying to say that it's reaching its world, become an enemy of God because they haven't distinguished themselves enough from the world? Just a question. Remember, you can text me any question what you think on these things in this. All right. Easy reading tonight, huh? Let's go verses uh, 11 through uh, 11 through 16. 11 through 16. Whom have you so dreaded and feared that you have not been true to me? And have neither remembered me nor taken this to heart. It is not because I have long been silent that you do not fear me. I will expose your righteousness and your works, and they will not benefit you. Wow, that's a a powerful word right there. They will not benefit you. Your righteousness, not his righteousness in our lives, our own self-righteousness, our own works. When you cry out for help, verse 13, let your collections of idols save you. The wind will carry all them off. A mere breath will blow them away. But whoever takes refuge in me will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. And it will be said, Build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. For this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. Here's the phrase that I love right here. We're going to look at this in detail in a moment to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I will not accuse them forever, nor will I always be angry, for then they would faint always because of me, the very people I have created. I love that word twice it came there in the NIV here, is to be revived in your spirit, to be revived in the spirit. I, as, I, as I thought about this, as, as I was studying this, this is just personal. These are four quick things that came to my heart in this. When God's Spirit ministers to us, to our spirit, to revive the Spirit, one, you feel revived when you've heard from God, don't you? I, I love Michael Bennett's testimony here. He didn't have to hear from professors. He didn't even have to hear from his grandparents or his parents. Who he needed to hear from was God. And you know what it does? It gives you a confidence to go forward, doesn't it? Number two, you feel revived when you've been forgiven. You know, that's probably something where, again, wanting to have friendship with the world and wanting them to feel okay, 
unless they feel the weight of their sin, they won't ask for forgiveness. If they think the sin is okay by the culture and okay by the church, why do they have to give it up? It's not okay by God. God had to send his most prized possession, his son, so that the sin could be taken care of. There's nothing that will revive a spirit greater than that feeling of forgiveness. Number three, you feel revived when your sins are not remembered. Now, I love when they're forgiven, but I, I, I love this. When I first started out, Michael, I gave my testimony everywhere also, and I so still felt like a sinner that's been saved that I focused a lot on the sin part of it. And I remember one time God said, focus on the difference part. That, that what sin? I don't remember that anymore. I put it as far as the east is from the west in the sea of forgetfulness. And, 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 and as I started focusing on that, he doesn't remember. I had more young men and especially tons of young women going, I need to know that it could be forgotten. This is important. You don't know what I've done with my life. You don't know the things that I carry when I look at certain things that's a trigger of my sin. I need to know that he says they're not remembered. I go, that's the promise. That's the promise in the book. And that becomes a powerful realm for the Holy Spirit to revive people's spirit when you go, that doesn't have a weight. Not only doesn't it have a weight that I'm guilty, I'm forgiven, but it's not remembered. Isn't it amazing when we get together with, with friends and families, a lot of times they want to throw up our past in our face and say, you remember when you did this? And go, God doesn't. God doesn't. When, 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 when I go back to my home church in Philadelphia, it, it's kind of cute because, you know, there was an aspect that I was a city kid that didn't really understand all the different things. And I did some harmless things like wrap the men's bathroom stall with cellophane, you know, all the way around. So when you opened it, you couldn't walk into the bathroom part of it. That janitor, is, he's in heaven today. His name's Jack Reese. But his son, Johnny, is a friend of mine on Facebook. And I love when he said, my dad was so glad you were in church. I said, I thought your dad hated me because I made his job tougher. He goes, no, he knew the home you were going home to. I said, man, he seemed like he was angry. Oh, he goes, that was that generation. But he goes, my dad was very proud of what was happening. And I thought, wow, his father didn't remember all the things I did to <laughs> torment and make his job tougher, that he cared about me, that my sins are not remembered. I love that. And the final thing in this for me personally in this, and you, you might want to go home and write, what revives your spirit in your relationship with the Holy Spirit? Very important things. Uh, probably several of these are yours also. You feel revived when you see transformation that God is doing. You see the transformation God is doing in your life, in your children's life, in your grandchildren's life, in your brothers and sisters, in your coworkers. When you see transformation, when you see, you go, I know they couldn't be this way without the power of God in it. That revives the community of believers spirit it revives the spirit and i love this portion in here even though it it really uh hits on a lot of tough things i love that it comes back to this to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite the broken heart to revive that broken heart pretty powerful all right the rest of the chapter verses 17 through 21 i was enraged by their sinful greed i punished them and hid my face in anger. Yet they kept on their willful ways. I've seen their ways, but I will heal them. Let that soak in for a minute. I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will guide them and restore comfort to Israel's mourners, creating praise on their lips. What's the praise that they're going to do? Peace, peace to those 
far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. This last portion of Isaiah 57 is really what our world is, is clamoring for. They want peace in the worst way. They don't realize peace won't come through something between the Palestinians and Israel. That's not where the peace comes from. The peace comes from God in our heart. And I wrote this little thing here, the gift of peace. I, I wrote this uh, this morning. Peace gives us a rest beyond sleep, a security greater than money, a contentment that says he is God. What a great gift of peace.